Hello, my name is Dr. Francis Ferre. I'm the director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center at Boston Medical Center and professor of medicine at the Boston University School of Medicine. Thank you for joining us today for Uncovering the Secret Sauce, Strategies for Increasing Prior Authorization Success Rates for Patients with Inflammatory Bowel Disease. This is the first of a three-part series designed to provide you with some best practice strategies that you can use to improve your success rates for prior authorization and to minimize the impact of prior authorization on staff administrative time, clinical workflow, and patient care. In part two of the series, we will highlight best practices in documentation in the electronic medical record to improve your prior authorization submissions. And in part three, we'll address denials and discuss strategies for the appeal process with the mindset that no doesn't necessarily mean no. Knowing that the activities will generate questions, we've created that platform so that you can submit your questions to us by completing the adjacent form. Responses to questions will be posted on the Gastroenterology Digital Hub at cmeoutfitters.com as part of a library of toolkits, templates, tracking spreadsheets, appeal templates, and patient education videos that you can use in your practice, and resources to share to use with team members that are also involved with the authorization process. Also, for those who complete the full series, CME Outfitters will provide a Certificate of Excellence in Prior Authorization. Prior authorization is clearly a team sport. Depending on the size and makeup of your practice, prior authorization may be handled by a medical assistant, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, physician, or even the specialty pharmacist. So our panel reflects that diversity. With me today are my esteemed colleagues, Michelle Rubin and Tony Zahorian. Michelle Rubin is an advanced practice nurse and associate director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center and director of advanced practice nursing at the University of Chicago. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Frank. Tony Zahorian is a clinical pharmacy specialist at the Center for Digestive Disorders at Boston Medical Center, and we work together in the office on all of these issues that we'll be discussing today. Welcome to the program, Tony. Thank you. In this first module, we are going to be focusing on improving processes for prior authorization. Our learning objective is to evaluate prior authorization methods that best fit clinical workflow to reduce disruption, establish clear communication with the payer, and minimize delays to treatment. We recognize that while the processes are the same, private practices do not have the same resources that we are fortunate to have in the academic medical center setting. So to be sure that we are addressing the challenges you face, I've reached out to a number of GI practices that refer patients to me to better understand some of the day-to-day -day challenges of prior authorization. As you can see from the clinician on the left, he's complaining of the fact that there's significant use of office resources that have continued only to grow in the past 10 years. They have their medical assistants do the work, but when all is said and done, there's a delay in getting recommended treatment and decreased patient satisfaction. For the clinician on the right, one of the things that she's complaining most of is the fact that they often have to regurgitate the same information on different prior authorization forms because in one particular case, the correct one was not filled out. And again, at the end of the day, the Dealing with prior authorizations is the most cumbersome and the worst part of my job, and I would certainly echo that. I think that many of the clinicians listening to this pro presentation will also agree that prior authorizations is not particularly satisfying, though something that we all need to do to help our patients. I collected uh, several other comments for the clinician on the left. You can see that when it comes to peer-to-peer, -to -peer, it's typically a battle of attrition. I think we do need to think of this as a battle. Basically, the insurance companies and the prior authorization companies have the number of folks who can basically push back, ask for more forms, and they have the numbers to basically wear you down. And this is something that thankfully in our practice with our pharmacy staff, we can often uh, work to push back on these. And then finally, for the clinician on the right, you can see that she is mostly troubled by doing peer-to-peer -peer reviews for imaging tests, but also has this for medications, but not as many. And in this particular case, it appears that the clinician submits a prior authorization for a medication. It's denied, and instead of doing a peer-to-peer, -peer, just makes the decision to accept the medication that the insurance company wants. So again, I'm sure that each and every one of you listening to this program have faced these typical battles. Michelle, 
The IBD Working Group did a survey recently on time spent on prior authorizations. Can you kind of fill us in on what they found? Well, Frank, a whole lot of communication is going on here, and you know how aggravating that can be in a practice, and particularly when you have uh, the individuals, perhaps an RNMA, you know, they got a lot of other things they're doing in a day, and when you're spending so much time communicating, uh, it, it's, it doesn't go well often. Uh, it takes away from patient care as well. So in this particular uh, study here, it was uh, communication with barriers is frequent. And as you can see there, that greater than five times a day for 73% of these calls, they are on the phone. And the other uh, aspect there, you see that it's greater than 10 times daily that they are calling in a day, and that took up 30% of the calls. So 67% of calls for pre or reauthorization of biologics are made by healthcare providers. So either a physician, an RN, nurse practitioner, PA, or an MA. 9.35% of those calls are made by physicians. And then 63% of respondents dedicate at least 25% of a full-time equivalent. So that's a lot. But what's also very concerning is here is that all the time that it's taking in a day for these practitioners, 30% of surveyed practices report that their office lacks a formal process for handling the PA workload. Thank you, Michelle. That was very informative. Tony, there are a number of ways to submit prior authorizations. Is there one way that works better than the others? Certainly, Frank. I think that's a wonderful question. Um, you can see on the slide that most providers do use multiple channels to submit prior authorizations, and all of these do have their benefits and their role in practice. However, I would argue that electronic PAs are the most effective and the most efficient. This can often be done through medical um, prior authorization portals, such as Cover My Meds, extremely useful because it does speed up the process. It also allows you to save your prior authorization so when that, that authorization expires, you can simply resubmit some, some of the work that was already done. Thank you, Tony. I understand that you polled some colleagues to find out their tips and tricks as well as some common roadblocks. Can you share that with us? Of course. I would say that the tips on this slide reflect the universal tip overall of just making sure that you're prepared. So you mentioned that some of your colleagues struggled with making sure that they had the correct forms. A lot of this research can be done in advance. One of the tips that I would recommend is identifying the top insurers in your practice and researching online what their criteria are for covering particular medications. If you're aware of this criteria in advance, you can make sure that it is addressed on your prior authorization form. In addition, I would say it's important to know which insurance your patient has. So if you are submitting to the incorrect insurance company, this means that you're going to have to repeat on a different form in the future. So whether that means reaching out to the patient's pharmacy or reaching out to the patient directly to ensure that you are choosing that correct insurance and that correct form will certainly save you time. Hopefully your preparation will pay off, but if it doesn't, my next tip would just be to network. So make sure you have connections within the insurance companies and even within the specialty pharmacies that you commonly use themselves so that you can reach out and ask questions and get clarifications if needed. The other thing I would be sure to do is track your PAs. Oftentimes this process does take a few days or even up to a week and it can be easy to forget which PAs have been submitted, which have been approved, and which are still waiting on a response. I would also recommend tracking wins and losses so that you can practice what has been successful in the past and repeat that with future patients. All of these tips are really just in an effort to help you get it right the first time around. We often find that if it's done right the first time, you'll be successful, but the more times you have to go through this process for a particular patient or a particular medication, the more hurdles you have to jump over. Thank you, Tony. I think these are all very practical for us to take back to our practices. Michelle, you're at the University of Chicago. It's a very large IBD center. Do you have a lot of templates that you use and have they been useful in getting prior authorizations through? Absolutely. Uh, we definitely uh, have multiple uh, templates put together for various biologics, for imaging, et cetera. Uh, it just makes it a much smoother process. You're not redoing uh, a letter every time. So having standardized forms is definitely a time saver. 
And as I said, they can be created for multiple biologics. And we include standard documentation of the medical need, but can also be customized to each patient's particular need. If there's some psychiatric issues that are uh, a complication and involved in this process, they can be added as well. And some excellent examples are also available online from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. There are multiple uh, different ones there for when you have to switch meds or when there is the uh, step up approach and that is not the appropriate approach with the patient, they also have forms for that. So yes, standardization is absolutely imperative to have. I know that in our practice, we use the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation forms as our template, and then we modify them as we move forward. So again, I would encourage all listeners to go to this particular website, download these forms, modify them if you feel they're appropriate, and then use them as your templates when submitting prior authorizations. So Tony, we work very closely together in the office. Um, as a specialty pharmacist, how can you and your colleagues in the pharmacy help us get the appropriate drugs to our patients? So I think this is another important topic to discuss. And I do want to mention the other important members of the pharmacy team. Aside from the pharmacists, there are also pharmacy technicians who are very helpful in the prior authorization process. Particularly pharmacists are going to be most helpful with the clinical services, helping the provider decide on the proper medication, the proper dose, reviewing for drug interactions, and potentially even educating the patient on this new medication. A lot of these infusions and injections can be nerve-wracking for the patient, and so to provide that education upfront is often helpful. This can also be helpful once the medication is approved to provide education on the importance of adherence and follow up with the patient once they do have their medicine. Pharmacists and pharmacy technicians are also helpful with the non-clinical services. This includes paperwork, completing the PA process, setting up peer-to-peers, and also helping with financial assistance if a patient is uninsured or has a large copay. Ultimately, this can help the providers by saving them time that they can spend with their patients instead of doing prior authorizations and completing paperwork. It also benefits the patient because ideally the patient is then getting their medication in a more timely manner. They have the support of a medication specialist in the pharmacist. Ideally, this also means that patient satisfaction is improved and maybe even patient quality of life if they are able to obtain that medication. Michelle, even with successful prior authorizations, co-pays can be a burden to patients, and they're very, very worried about these co-pays. Are there programs that can help ease the burden for our patients? Absolutely, Frank. And it's very important to not forget about these, the co-pay assistance and achieving uh, co-pays for your patients. And this should be something considered right up front when you're going to be putting a patient on these biologics, get them hooked in right away with the uh, co-payment program. Uh, co-pay assistance, uh, they can supplement $12,000 to $20,000 a year. You know, these biologics are very expensive. And the patient can end up paying nothing to maybe $5 a month. This is a significant benefit for the patient. So it's imperative that you get these patients hooked up uh, with a copay card. And as you can see, all the biologics that are listed here with the specific websites uh, to sign up for their savings card. Michelle, thank you for filling us in on what the options are for our patients who have commercial insurance. But what about patients with Medicare? So with Medicare Part D, the options for coverage are much different. And obviously there is that initial uh, deductible phase and then you fall into this donut hole where the co-pays become much higher. And often patients cannot afford these co-pays because you know with a lot of these medications and particularly the biologics, they are extremely expensive. So once they fall into this uh, area, this donut hole, it's like, where do we go with them from there? And Tony, maybe you can inform us on what happens at this point and from, where do, from here, where do we go with patients? I think this is important because patients who do not have commercial insurance, so those Medicare patients, do not qualify for the programs discussed on the previous slide. So oftentimes what will happen is the pharmacy will notice a high copay, and we can switch this coverage from pharmacy through Medicare Part D to medical benefit through their Medicare Part A and B. And this will cover the medication without a copay to the patient. They will still pay if it's an infusion to come in and sit down and receive the medicine, but they won't pay that high cost for the medication out of pocket. 
And Tony, do they have to uh, submit any tax forms or anything to assist with uh, coverage under Medicare? Is, there, is that based on need? Often not. They already have the Medicare Part A and B, and that does cover these medications. So you would just have to cancel your PA through the pharmacy insurance. You wouldn't need a prescription, and it would just get covered automatically. Okay, great. Treating patients with Medicare, as you can see, can be very, very difficult. I would refer the listener to the series of links at the end of this program that can give you some other helpful hints on how to arrange for coverage for your patients with Medicare. So now we've discussed patients who have commercial insurance, patients with Medicare. I'd like Tony to tell us what to do if a person has no insurance at all. What can we do to help these patients? This is another bit of a problematic patient population. They often do need medications that they cannot afford. There are a number of foundations for IBD patients that can assist with medication coverage. Unfortunately, a lot of the IBD disease state funds are often out of medications because they are utilized at such a high rate. However, we do have an alternative option in our patient assistance programs. These are extremely useful for those patients who do not have insurance or maybe they had insurance and now they're in a gap phase. I know Frank and I had a patient like that recently. We are currently signing up for one of these patient assistant pro assistance programs. As you can see on this slide, eligibility criteria do vary for the patient assistance programs and there are websites available for each of the biologic medications. These websites can be accessed by your care team to help the patient apply for these funds. This has been a great discussion today. We always want our goals to be SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. As we wrap up, let's leave the audience with some takeaways and action items to improve their PA process. Michelle, can you start off for us? Absolutely. Number one, identify the top five insurers in your practice and know the information they require. That is of utmost importance so when that you start this process that you get it right the first time and it makes it go uh, smoother from there on. Develop and download templates to use for PA. This just simplifies the process and expedites the, the entire process to uh, getting the PAs filled out. Take advantage of EPA systems that allow you to submit online. This also expedites the process and sort of gives you a real-time look at what is going on with the system. And Tony, can you bring us up with the last three SMART goals? Certainly. Assess patient um, assistance programs to help bridge co-pays and provide coverage for those patients who don't, do not have insurance or a, are in an insurance gap. Develop a tracking process to ensure that your PA requests do not get lost. And then finally, track your wins and losses. Make sure that if things are going well, they continue to go well. And if things aren't working, then you can tweak the process to make it better for your practice. I'd like to thank Michelle and Tony for this very practical discussion and for sharing their insights, experience, and strategies for maneuvering the prior authorization process. Please visit the Gastroenterology Digital Hub at cmeoutfitters.com where you will find all three modules as well as template letters, checklists, and spreadsheets to help you build and improve your process. You will also find a video for patients explaining what they can expect from the process that you may find helpful. Thank you for joining us today. We sincerely hope that we were able to provide you with the tools to improve your processes, allowing for more time for patient education, meeting patients' medical needs, and improving outcomes in your patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Thank you.